for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this paper that I'm about to present has been presented already as, as mentioned by Ma, and it's also part of my essay. It's chapter one of my, or essay one of my dissertation. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, Sita, for granting me the Double Grants Award. And then, um, uh, in line with that, I have already incorporated the suggestions made by the panel member during that time. So, we will notice some changes in the title that you can see from the uh, Comparing the, the one that we have seen in the advertisement and the one that we have seen on currently on the slide. So uh, there has been some uh, you know suggestions that I have to incorporate. Uh, according to them, I have to uh, divide the household into three as a whole, those really receiving remittances, and of course, uh, food, and sec food secure and food insecure households, and then trying to measure how the remittances have been utilized by these three types of households. Okay, so let's uh, continue. But maybe some of you are wondering why I have chosen this topic out of so many topics already. Uh, there are two reasons why. Okay. Oops, it's not moving. Yes, there we go. So the first reason why I have chosen this topic is because remittances are essential source of funds for the economy as it accounts for about 10% uh, of the gross domestic product. And then the second reason, uh, is we know that the, that the remittances do have direct on recipient families as it may uh, serve, may serve as additional source of funds for uh, consumption smoothing, for investment purposes, either for human capital or non-human capital, and of course, uh, in the engaging uh, in the entrepreneurial activities. Then the third reason why I have chosen this topic is uh, uh, because numerous studies have already been made focusing on the, how the remittances uh, have been spent by the recipient families, no? but it's more on the aggregate and not uh, disaggregated like the one that I have done. It's now uh, basically divided into three uh, food groups, uh, sorry, six food groups. Uh, we have the uh, cereals, animal source food, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, and oil. Okay. And uh, aside from that, uh, we have also categorized the three types of households. Right? So the goal of this study is to examine how total food expenditure on uh, specific food groups are associated with remittances among the remittance recipients, uh, food secure households, and food insecure households. So specifically addressing the following uh, questions. The first one is, do remittance recipients have higher food expenditure than non recipients? And of course, do food secure households have higher food expenditure than food insecure households. And of course that one is more on the discriminatory part. And then the two the second, the third and the fourth are are inflation, statistics. So the second is is there a difference in the budget share of food expenditure when households do receive remittances? And the third, how do remittance recipients, food secure and food insecure households use the remittances on food spending? And the last one, which of the other factors are significantly affecting the uh, budget share of food expenditure of households. So uh, we have incorporated some other factors, uh, both uh, household characteristics and household care characteristics. All right, so let's continue. So uh, for this study, I have used two uh, economic theories. So the first one is uh, Engel's law, and the second one is the permanent income hypothesis. So I'll just give you a uh, you know, brief background about Engel's law. So it is the fraction of income spent on food that declines as income increases. On the other hand, the fraction of income spent on non-food, such as health and education, are expected to increase as income rises. So in this study, our uh, our you know the additional income is brought about by the remittances. Okay, so as as income rises brought about by the remittances, would would it uh, increase or decrease the budget share of food or not? First, in this study, our aim is that we have to, you know, uh, confer uh, with the Ingles law, and that is when the income uh, rises, we're expecting that the budget share of food will tend to decline. All right. Now, the second view is the permanent income hypothesis. So you notice uh, on the slide that we have two types of income. The one is permanent, and the other one is transitory income. So when you talk about permanent income, we have, uh, you know, regular income being expected uh, to come in the household. And then transitory is uh, irregular, 
so this is what I did. You know, sometimes you do the same, sometimes you do the same. Now, when, when the family is expecting a, an income that is permanent, regular, they consume it for, you know, for uh, food or for consumption smoothie, you know, or for ordinary expenditure. But when that income is uh, not expected, you know, it's, it's valuable, then that income is actually being used for investment purposes. So our target in this study is to find out if renewed access is being treated as 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 uh, a permanent income or as a transitory income. Okay, so the working lesson model, okay, uh, is the chosen functional norm that is actually consistent with the household utility maximization. And then uh, we'll uh, I have also used the topic uh, regression approach. To avoid the temptation and the selection, sample selection bias uh, pres present in uh, ordinary basis here. And of course, COVID in the sense that uh, the budget share that is equivalent to zero is observed. You know? So uh, in OLS, we usually drop the zero, but this time the zero has a meaning, so we cannot simply drop because it will really create some sample size, sample size, uh, sample selection bias. All right, so other than that, there is also potential problem and that is the individuality embedded in the meaningless variable. So we have to correct that by using some metal variables. So and other than that we have also used some some metal dynamic math but we are going to deal with that. So for the instrumental variables uh, I, I used a study of um, in 2009 household assets. So we have actually two groups under that. Uh, the first one is um, Ownership of cars, television, and refrigerator, and the second one under the household asset, the ratio of entrepreneurial activity, the ratio of entrepreneurial income to total income. Now, for postcode 2008, another uh, bunch of instrumental variable, uh, we have uh, at least one family member is working abroad, or at least one friend or relative is working abroad that sends me access to the household. Okay, so. Yeah, regarding the data set that I have used, uh, I have used uh, the uh, uh, family income and expenditure survey in Brentwood. It's a nationwide uh, survey of households undertaken every two years of the building of the agency. Okay, so this is actually the step by step procedures that I have used for, for the study, but I'm not going to discuss that in detail. Yes, so finally we arrived at the results and discussion part. Yeah, just take a deep breath. <laughs> okay, so um, using or based on the um, 40,000 households, more than one third of the total households receive remit access. So one third is, is kind of big. Uh, unfortunately, 4% are highly vulnerable to food insecurity. But you might wonder what do you mean when you say food insecurity? Households. Food insecure households are actually households that do spend 70% of their total uh, income for food. Yes. So then this 4% are actually divided into two. The food secure groups, okay, uh, only 1%, while the food uh, yeah, just a minute, I have to look at my yeah. For which 1% receive remittances and the first 3% without remittances. Now, household heads are older, more educated, dominated by males, and of course, uh, rural dwellers. Uh, these are the remittance recipient households compared to non remittance recipients. And uh, with roughly 30% higher per capita expenditure compared to their counterpart. And then the uh, same family size has been observed for both uh, remittance and non remittance uh, recipients, approximately three family members per, per household. Okay, so. Yes. Next is um, between food insecure and food secure households. You notice that food secure households have more number of remittance recipients than food insecure households. So you look at the figures: thirty-six percent of the food secure households do receive remittance, while thirty percent of the food insecure households do receive remittance. Of course, um, describing the food insecure household that is the food secure. Household heads are older, less educated, dominated by males, and of course, mostly women dwellers. And, and the family size is bigger, and their per capita income is twice as low than to those food secure households. Yes, let's move on. 
let's start answering the, the first um, objective of the study. So, first, uh, do remittance recipients of higher food expenditure than other recipients? Look at the, the column for that. Uh, we have uh, remittance recipients versus non remittance recipients. And of course, our answer is yes. And what about the second question? Do food secure households have higher food expenditure than food insecure households? Look at the last two columns. We have the food insecure and food secure. What have you noticed? Again, the food secure are far higher, you know, they do spend higher than the food insecure. And take a look at that, the, the, the one in red uh, uh, font color. No? Uh, animal source foods and fruits. You notice that there is really a big gap between the food insecure households and food secure households when it comes to the animal source foods. We know that there are many nutrients that we can get from the animal source foods, uh, and same thing with the food. Now, this is the uh, per capita annual expenditure in peso. Now, if we try to translate this in a per day basis and compare it with the standard, what will happen? Uh, for the food insecure, the, the per capita yeah, per capita expenditure per day, of course per person, is approximately for the animal source food is about 34 pesos per day. Now what about for food secure? Per day, per person, about 80 pesos per day. Now you might question me, what is the standard? So, so what is the minimum requirement? Uh, the, the, yeah, the required daily food expenditure for that particular item. Uh, it's actually 62 peso. So if you imagine, 62 peso the standard, food insecure but only use only 34, and then the food secure do use 80, more than the uh, average, no? or more than the standard. So really the food insecure are worse off in this situation. Now try to look at the foods. The foods, uh, if convert it again into a daily basis, uh, we have 2 peso per person per day for the food insecure, and then uh, for the food secure, we have about 7 peso per day. Question, what is the standard uh, expenditure per day per person? It's actually, uh, it's actually 9 peso per day. So, compare again, 2 peso against 7 peso. Both groups are actually, you know, not meeting the standard. But again, the food insecure are the one facing Know, worse of in the worst of sight. No. So, so let's uh, let's have a story about it. Now let's have more. Let's answer the second uh, objective. Uh, is there a difference in the budget share of food expenditure when households do receive training access? So our target is to look at the coefficient of the predicted remittance no? uh, and its effect on the basket on the food basket. So again, who again we refer that to the you know, the entire households that do receive premium access, and then for the food insecure households that do receive premium access, and food secure that do receive premium access. And of course, the sign, the asterisk pertains to the level of significance of 1%, and the positive pertains to the relationship of that budget share toward the, yeah. Um, okay, so let's, let's try to look at this. Comparing again, the whole, or uh, as a whole, and uh, the food sector households, uh, the middle recipients do have higher budget share on cereals, animal source foods, vegetables, okay? But uh, the middle recipients do have lesser budget share on fruits and sugar. Now let's have uh, more. The third, um, let's have the third uh, objective, and that is to answer how do we access recipients how do remittance recipients, food secure and food insecure households, use their remittance on food spending? And this is actually the heart of the paper. Okay. So this um, objective will actually help us to analyze uh, the two economic theories that I have uh, shown you a while ago. Okay, so this time our target is to look at the interaction term coefficient, you know, its effect on the food basket. Again, we have three sets of group, uh, household types, and all these household types do receive living assets. Our target is how they do use these living assets on food spending. Now, this, the coefficient of the interaction that is actually no other than the MPC. So MPC is the marginal propensity to consume. So what is the marginal propensity to consume? That is the change in consumption.
sanction over the change in income. So, the change in income or the additional income is actually due to remittances. And of course, we try to find out if once the income rises, would, would people be buying more of that particular good or not? And again, remember the Engels law? According to Engels law, um, it is uh, the fraction of income spent on food declines as income rises due to remittances. And uh, on the other hand, as income rises, you know, the non-food would tend to rise. You know? And if you look at this, on the average, really, the angles to has been satisfied. You know? uh, all the food, uh, cereals, animal source food, and vegetables. So the moment they receive extra income, you know, the households would tend to buy less of these items. The question is, why less? Because these foods are actually the you know, normal food or uh, stable food. Now try to look at the fruits and uh, sugar. Once households receive additional income, what about the remittances? They tend to buy extra of these quantities. So you might wonder why. And the question, the answer is basically we people to consider fruits and sugar as uh, special food. So the moment we receive extra income, we tend to ourselves <laughs> with this extra thing. Alright, so what else? Um, so we were able to satisfy the income flow. And uh, what about in terms of permanent income hypothesis? So a while ago we said that when uh, uh, if the remittance is being treated as permanent or regular, then we're expecting that households will consume more of the ordinary consumption, like food. But then if it is treated as or a variable income or transitory income, then people would tend to use this remittance on, on, you know, for investment purposes. So if you look at the signs, of course, uh, staple foods, the food, the cereals, animal source foods and vegetables, these are the common food that we used to buy and that, that, that really uh, picks up the majority of our food consumption. You notice that really uh, the remittance is not treated as a permanent income. It is being treated as a, a transitory and it is not being used for consumption smoothing like, like food. It is being used for other purposes. But again, why fruits and sugar? Again, these are considered as a special risk or a special food. That's why uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's not part of the uh, ordinary strategy that we're expecting.
males. Uh, but they need to prioritize, of course, cereals, animal source, food, specific group, and fruits. Okay. Compared to females. Okay. So let's have another set, and that is the age. Okay. So the older the household head, the lesser they would tend to spend on food as a whole, except for fruits. Okay, so maybe we can ask some, you know, older generation house of pet if it is true. But uh, based on my uh, personal survey, it is true. They do spend more on, on fruits, but less on total food. Okay, maybe because of the sickness of the animal. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, so let's have um, education. So for education, most educated household heads are spending less on total food on the average, except for vegetables. No? Okay, there's vegetables, except for vegetables. Primarily due to do better understanding about the importance of vegetables on, on, on the health um, of the family. But if you look at the food insecure, where are you? Yes, cereals is positive. So what is the, the idea behind it? The more educated under the category of food insecure, they would tend to buy more on cereals. The tendency is cereals definitely will make our family full you know, for the entire duration. And since food insecure are, you know, houses that, that, that are full, that are poor, so I expect that they, as, as you know, that the, the mind will dictate that this will, these are the qualities or these are the food items that will make the family full for the entire duration of the includes rice. Yes, um, Okay, so let's have the family size. For the family size, the bigger the family size, the lesser is the total food budget share because there are more mouths to feed. But specifically, definitely all the items will tend to rise in terms of budget share. Now let's have Urban. Uh, for Urban, um, whether households are rural, rural or urban dwellers, food budget shares are unaffected, unaffected except for vegetables and Sugar. Okay, so I hope that we were able to answer the four objectives. Let's have now the conclusions. Okay, so for the conclusions, the uh, overall findings show that households receiving the assets tend to spend more on food than non recipients, especially uh, in animal source food and in uh, fruits. No? So they are actually better off. Uh, and then uh, additional income to remittances lowers the value share of total food, thereby confirming endo stock, okay, except for uh, sugar and uh, fruits, because these are considered as special and not ordinary food. And then with regard to the, to the test of permanent income hypothesis, the study finds that remittances are, are treated as a variable source of additional income, therefore it's not being spent for consumption smoothing like ordinary spending but for for more productive uh, items or for investment purposes. And then majority of the controlled variables such as uh, sex, uh, age, family size, okay, a little bit of patient and uh, a bit of location dummy are significant in most cases and comply with expected science. This study provides evidence that remittances tend to play an important role in food expenditure. Thus, by continuously providing incentives to promote the flows of transfers among recipient families effectively and efficiently will aid them to further maximize their utility, especially for the nutritious foods. That's end my presentation. Thank you for listening. That's my only daughter. sharing with us the results of your study on how remittances affect the food spending of uh, households. Um, the floor is now ready for your questions, comments, or insights. Anybody from the floor? Because uh, 
you said that uh, you need some survey. So what I was wondering is uh, how much was rural uh, samples and urban samples? And out of the rural samples, how many are farmers having farm? Because that would influence maybe uh, expenditure in, in the food sec sector. Because the people who live in the farm, they are used to eat fruits and vegetables because they grow natural to them. But people in the urban area, if they don't have enough money, they will not really buy, maybe they will uh, just limit themselves, especially the non food secure. So what, we, what was the partitioning of the samples? Actually, uh, the survey, the data came from the family income expenditure survey uh, delivered or done by uh, Philippine uh, Physical Authority. So it's the 40,000 household uh, sample. Now, uh, I have mentioned something about, uh, I made a personal survey. It's, it's not really included in the study. The focus of the study is really the usage of the, 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 the data that I have used from the family income expenditure survey. Now, regarding the distribution of farmers to non-farmers, unfortunately, the data set won't have that. And then, uh, the data set only have uh, urban versus rural. But the definition of the urban is really the moment there is a cemented road, it's not really an urban. So, so that, that classifying really is it's really an urban or rural area. So, that's another... But the rural does not suggest that they are having farms, right? Yes, yes. Because so, many in the role there are employees, like yes. government employees or teachers. Yes. Like. And, and uh, based on the study, majority of the sample came from the urban area. So it would really be better if, if the suggestions that you have would be uh, done. Uh, fortunately, the data set uh, would not require. But if there's a fund, uh, <laughs> it is very nice to do this uh, thing that we have in mind, sir. Yeah, because uh, as you were saying, let us uh, ask for uh, old people because they have all their preferences for food. You mentioned about that, right? The older people. Yes, yes. I just asked some of my uh, yeah, because, uh, older friends, but, but not in the paper itself. So it's just, you know, verifying if, if the if your curiosity. We, we, we had, uh, we had, uh, because we, we grew up in the uh, olden times where there were not so many people, but there were so many agricultural goods. So we had different perception when we see vegetables, rather than uh, uh, hot dogs or other things that are processed. Yes. We didn't have that. Even uh, with ice cream, we do not prepare too much ice cream. Of course, the food insecure, whether they are in the rural or in the uh, urban, they sometimes do not buy ice cream. Yes, yes, uh, I got your uh, point, sir. Unfortunately, it's really centered or focusing on the urban, maybe urban levels, because majority of the sample sites are coming from the urban, urban, urban area. Yeah. So, not much uh, other distinction of farm and non farm area. So, that's a good study. But perhaps, um, of course, we cannot say the provincial uh, data set, because again, we can say that some provinces are you know, urban and rural. So if, if there is a, you know, uh, uh, project that... <laughs> I just want more comment rela relative to the food. You know the junk foods, right? Yes, yes. And uh, the coming administration would like to tax it for uh, as sin foods. Because they are not really, uh, what do you call it? Uh, probably healthy food. But, they, but anyway, uh, because I am old, we did not have too much junk food. But how much of the urban dweller buy junk foods in relation to the Syrians? Or where do you classify them? Uh, Syrians compose of rice, uh, oatmeal, yeah, yeah, yeah. so bread. How about the junk foods? Not included. But I uh, assume that they, they maybe are part yes, of yes, the uh, yeah. uh, It is impossible that the junk food would not be separated from the entire Syrian section, but it's not uh, being separated. So, so that's the problem because it's already aggregated. The data for the Syrian is aggregated. So maybe another study that would be of interest on my side is the chocolate. Yeah, I'll think about it.
Maybe you can include junk food in the process. Uh, process. The, the process. Process. Yeah. process food. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, because there is a process food item in the family income and expenditure survey. Yeah. So. So uh, since uh, you use the FIES data, right? Yes. And then you mentioned that mostly it's urban. Yes. Uh, why, why did you include rural data if it's mostly urban? Why not just use the urban data if it will just create outliers? Oh, nice suggestion. I think uh, I'll, I'll try to look at the rural data and then I'll compare it with the urban Expenditure per okay. food item. Were you referring to house female household heads or female headed households? You mentioned female household heads, male household heads. Is that what you meant or male headed households, yeah, female headed households? I, I assume that they are just the same. Uh, we no, have the same. Female, house, uh, female household head and uh, female headed by household. Uh, yeah, because you mentioned that female household heads, they're also the ones who buy these food items. Uh, but if they're female-headed households, this doesn't necessarily follow that they're the ones who decide on what to buy mm -hmm. and which food items to acquire. Okay, so perhaps in the study, I would just make a, you know, a of the assumption that these uh, female household heads are the ones who decide for the the is the OFW, is it the male or the female? Because if the OFW is the male, then it follows that the female is the head of the household uh, in no, the Philippines. It, it, it's not measured. Yeah, I don't have the data system. Ah, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. If, 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 if the, the one who said it's really not saying, or the OFW is the male or the female, I don't have the data. So. But, but the reason that I, I noted that is because if it's a female-headed household, it means that the female is the one who decides. Mm -hmm. it has, it's a, there's a decision-making processes within the household. Yes, yes, I know. So I think it's important for you to disaggregate the data and then to look, look more into it. Yeah, who, who's the decision-maker? Yeah, but uh, I am not so sure if in the final data there is some kind of, uh, you know, follow that pertains to who really decides the food items. Because in the data, there is no and then, and then what's your population size? 4,000? 14. 14. 14. Uh, this one besides me, you know. Yes, uh, uh, it's a nationwide survey that by, yeah. Yeah. Yes. so I am uh, assuming that it's uh, proportionally uh, surveying. I would just like to make a, to seek clarification on one of the slides that says uh, when the when the remittances increase or when the, 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 the expenditure of the food decreases, is it? The angle is low, is it? Yes, yes, yes. Why is it so? Because when money comes in, uh, the household would not spend on food, but spend on buying new television sets, cell phones. So it's true. It, it's ha it happens in in reality, yes. Um, according to NIAR, uh, the one that I have uh, read, uh, when the family or households is receiving uh, remittances, they would be considered better off if they are allocating a small portion of uh, food. Coming, I mean, the additional income that they are receiving from remittances have been used for, for food. So once it is small or it's negative, then that means that the people are better off. So that's another study or another, you know, um, uh, reasoning that uh, the remittance certificates are actually better off in the sense that the, the mostly the, the fraction of income spent on food goes down when the additional income rises or when the income rises. Why? Uh, exactly the aliens uh, know that, uh, you know, uh, the fraction of income spent on food declines as income rises because the people that do receive this remittances or additional income are beginning to be 
become better off. That's why they would definitely prioritize the non-food item than so the assumption is that it's the, the, the people the tourists living in Texas are better off. But you also said that the, that the expenditure on sugar and uh, what's the other item? Uh, fruits. Fruits increases. Yes. 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 Uh, we know that uh, fruits and sugar are not just what you in the ordinary plate of the person. And these are active foods that are categorized as you know, special or special plate you know, for, for the household. Only being purchased if there is an extra in the plate of the But the rest, they are ordinary plates in the table. Yeah. I think the way Engels law applies to Philippine poverty is that 70% of the household expenditure of poor Filipinos are spent on food because they are more on subsistence, vulnerable families. But if income comes in, uh, they tend to rise above the poverty level and then they will be able to buy more food or their choices would improve like sugar, fruits, well actually it's meat for protein. That's why their nutrition would improve if you look at the food and nutrition security here in the Philippines. They would tend to buy what they need, what they want, and then because if they have limited income, they would, they would first, they would prioritize food, then house home improvement or vehicles or better schooling. But if because of these remittances, the family income, household income would increase, they would like uh, secondary better schooling by maybe another livelihood source of income, more clothes, and then food, the percentage spent on food will not actually decrease. Uh, it will actually, it will still increase the actual amount, but the percentage relative to the income will decrease. Yeah, that's how Engels law applies yeah, to Philippine families. Yeah. But that's why I mentioned vulnerable families. Yeah. Yeah. So since the, the study tells us that it's the delinquency is uh, just you know viable income, mm. so it's it's the reverse that happens. I have a question in relation to who decides uh, what to buy. I <laughs> for some time I uh, I lived in uh, Bangladesh and uh, the, the people who decide what to buy will be the maids and then all, also the ones doing the marketing. Okay? Because the female, they don't have to go out. They are usually in the house. Even the, and the salesman, salesman in the, in the store, there are no sales lady, only man. And also doing the marketing will be man. Now, my question is, uh, I know that in the Philippines, Majority will be female, but there are, I think, some household. The one who decides what food to buy is the male. So, what, what is the <laughs> sectioning about that? In, in, of course, uh, in southern Mindanao, we have Muslim. I don't know if they also practice that uh, uh, the man is the one going to the market. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, the assumption in this study is that. The moment the maid is considered as a uh, household head, then he is the one deciding for uh, how to spend the, the budget. So that is the assumption that I have made in, uh, in my mind. So uh, actually, as I mentioned, there is no special section uh, that, that uh, answers who really decide or who has the, uh, the power to decide on, on how to allocate the, the budget. Yeah, maybe it's, it's true that uh, some males decide, some, uh, yes. but uh, it is also always the mother who goes to the market. And she is the one picking uh, what food uh, she will be buying. Yes. Um, for that particular section about uh, female and uh, male, I just to say that the variable for that. So one, if it is for male, and a thousand and zero for, for male. So the sign of positive and negative goes for positive for me and negative for for me. So if it is positive, uh, more for the maid. If it is negative, uh, more for me and less for me, something like that. But again, the deciding power that 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 that, that go to, uh, I don't think there is a section. But I'm going to double check the question of uh, if they have the 
question that will be very helpful in this study.